The Secretary will read the first order. Debate on Vote 11, Agriculture, Western Cape Appropriation Bill. I see Minister Windy. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Premier Zilla, Cabinet colleagues, HOD and officials from agriculture, residents of the Western Cape that are here today, and of course those that are out there, and the media. I'm standing before you today during an extraordinary time in our agricultural sector. This month, we learned that the Western Cape's agricultural sector is creating jobs at the fastest pace in the country. According to the latest <coughs> figures from Stats SA, the number of employed people in our agricultural sector has grown more than 63% year on year. This is compared to 16% nationally. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, 70% of the new jobs created in South Africa's agricultural sector over the last year were created in this very province. And there are now 214,000 people employed in the Western Cape's agricultural sector. These gains are due in part to the decisions we have taken as a Western Cape government, where through our Project Kulisa growth strategy, we have gone all out in those sectors with the biggest potential for growth and jobs. Government must give policy and clear policy certainty, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is also due to the strong positive sentiment from the private sector, many of you who are here today. And I'm pleased to say that the growth we are seeing results from the hard work that we have put in together. And this really fits in with Better Together. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to thank the agribusinesses and farmers, both smallholder and commercial, for their continued support and their contribution to job creation in our province. And they are here today, many of them. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, while we are making phenomenal progress, it is important to celebrate the fact that our agricultural sector here in the Western Cape is South Africa's highest job-creating region, and we are still, but we uh, in this region are still facing a major challenge. Parts of the African continent are experiencing terrible drought. And Speaker, as we make this uh, uh, speech today and over the last few days, we might have been blessed by some rains and even some early snow. It is still a very, very big issue and it will be with us for some time to come. In response, the Southern African Development Community has approved a, declara has approved a declaration of the regional drought disaster and they estimate that the number of people affected by the drought could rise to 50 million, up from the current estimated 28 million. The national government estimates that the current drought will cost the country's economy in the region of 16 billion rand. And in the Western Cape, we are estimating about 1.2 billion rand loss just to the white wine and uh, uh, fruit industries alone. Analysts report that consumers will pay nearly 30% more for a basket of stable food this year. This increase uh, will hit the poorest of the poor the hardest. Because we now cannot afford to lose the precious water resources we have, we have also stepped in to divert disaster uh, when the canal feeding scheme at the, at the uh, uh, Clan William Dam was badly damaged, affecting supply to farms downstream. We approved emergency funding of just under one million to divert the water and repair the damaged wall, restoring the flow to normal levels. The drought is threatening the future of our agricultural sector, forcing us to work even harder at securing and growing job creating, uh, the job creating sector. Indeed, with this budget, we have put a plan in place to invest in the future of our agricultural sector. Speaking in total, 787.8 million rand has been allocated to the Department of Agriculture for the 2016-17 financial year. Our overarching goal we have set ourselves is to increase sustainable agricultural production by at least 10% by 2025. In line with Project Kulisa, we have set ourselves additional agri-processing targets, which is to add up to a further 100,000 jobs in this sector 
and to increase the agri-processing sector's GVA, or, 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 or gross uh, value add, from 12 billion rand to 26 billion rand in the next five years. Despite the challenge to the fiscus, we are sticking to these goals. Now let us uh, get into the detail of how we will get this job done. At the start of my term, I selected transformation as one of my top priorities. The failure rate of land reform projects in this country is far too high, Speaker, and the pace of transformation is far too slow. I have visited too many projects where beneficiaries are struggling because they have not received the tools they need to establish growing and successful agricultural enterprises. There's actually one speaker where we send regular letters off. Uh, I've been in this position for nearly two years, and one of the first places I visited was a farm handed over in called Bellevue. And still today, as I stand here, we do not have a lease in place. How can you expect anyone to farm without a lease in place? You cannot open a bank account. You cannot get your business going two years later. It's unacceptable, Speaker. To change this, we need a dedicated effort. The Western Cape, in the Western Cape, we have set ourselves a path to ensure that 70% success rate of all land reform projects we invest in. Now, 70%, Speaker, that's up from 62% in the last measurement. And uh, I see the HOD smiling because uh, it is a stretch target. Uh, I was trying to push these boundaries, and I was, uh, we, we had a debate on it, may I say. Um, and 70%, I think, is still a stretch target. But it is a target, and we will do our very, very best to make sure that we achieve this. In the 2016-17 financial year, the Farmer Support and Development Program will receive 259.8 million rand to make this happen. In the past financial year, we've given 1,572 emerging farmers the tools they need to grow their enterprises. Over the next three years, we will support 4,195 new farmers to take their businesses to the next level. One of the farmers who illustrates the kind of success we want to replicate is Carol Kirkwood Pretorius, and uh, who I see is here today, welcome, amongst uh, many other of her colleagues. Carol joins us in this house today, along with 15 other leading women in the agricultural sector who are featured in the latest edition of Abundant Harvest, and I'd like to welcome you all here today. And you all have a copy of this abundant harvest on the desk in front of you. Carol, with the support of our Farmer Support Development Program, bought a derelict farm in the Karoo to farm just 20 sheep. Today, she has a herd that has grown to 147, and her product has been certified as Karoo lamb, which gives her the marketing edge. Abundant Harvest features the province's top agribusinesswoman, all of whom have one female farmer or f a female entrepreneur of the year, and you will be receiving a copy of this publication today, which showcases how these agri-entrepreneurs are creating jobs and taking our sector forward. These are the stories, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that we in this province really need to celebrate. Over the past months, I have been crisscrossing the province, meeting with many of the other farmers we are also supporting. I had the pleasure of meeting Andres van der Poel, who farms out of Clipdrift. Andres is one of the province's land reform success stories. As profitable agribusinesses, we are working with Andres uh, to reach his goal of operating as an independent commercial farmer. During our meeting, Andres told me how his young son Joshua asked him what subjects he needed to take at school if he wanted to become a farmer. And, uh, Speaker, this is where we begin to see real transformation, as we want more of these stories in the province. While Andres is running a profitable business, like any entrepreneur, he faces his share of challenges. At the moment, the most pressing of these challenges is the drought. We have requested 88 million rand from the national government in drought relief. While national considers our request, farmers have very real obligations and cannot wait for the onerous government processes. That's why in the Western Cape we have granted emerging farmers 11 million rand in emergency funding to ensure that they can pay their workers and that the losses they suffer because of the drought will not put them out of business. And Speaker, uh, it's not in my speech, but uh, there were some phone calls and some discussion in the passageway outside, and I can announce today that uh, through this department, 
really, really taking the interests of agriculture to heart and the meaning of this drought to this industry. In the last while, we have been working very hard at uh, not spending uh, or wasting any money in any space, and we have managed to scrape together an extra 23 million rand that we will be making available for this drought in this province. This is another way that we have invested in the future of the agricultural sector. We are also supporting agribusinesses to strengthen their export position by growing exports from the current value add of 16.3 billion per annum. Between 2003 and 2012, the value of South African agricultural exports increased by 261% to 6.7 billion US dollars. We know that if new farmers are to grow, they need access to the right markets. To deliver on this, we have put a dedicated unit in place. The Agricultural Economic Services Program receives 23.4 million rand to provide expert economic advice. Speaker Project Kulisa, our strategy to double the size of the agri-processing sector, outlines our detailed and practical plan to increase exports in selected markets. Over the past year, we have been developing this strategy with the private sector, and together we've come up with a set of clear strategies to reach Project Police's goals. To start, we will improve uh, local production capacity for domestic and key ex export markets. Currently, South Africa has duty-free, quota-free market access for dairy products to the European Union. But our lack of the required residue testing facilities means that we are unable to export to that market. In response, I am pleased to announce that we will invest in a 9 million rand testing facility in the Western Cape Department of Agriculture's Helderfontein Veterinary uh, Laboratory to provide for the testing of minimum residue levels of export products. In another boost for local production capacity, we are continuing to work on the Greater Bruntflay Irrigation Project. By increasing the height of the Bruntflay Dam's inlet canal, we will be able to irrigate another 4,400 hectares of land in the Breda and Langeberg municipalities. This project will deliver a significant job creation boost, adding up to 8,000 jobs to our economy. These job opportunities will especially impact rural communities, a key priority of this department. And in this financial year, the Rural Development Program receives 21.9 million rand. Our Rural Development Program has particular focus on the province's 124,000 agricultural sector employees, where, uh, which will continue our province-wide household survey of the sector's employees so that we ensure that we are able to match our program of action with their needs. Speaker, the Greater Bruntflay Irrigation Project will uh, go a long way towards creating an extra irrigation capacity for our vineyards, which is tied to our second goal, namely to increase exports in wine to China and Angola. China, the world's fastest growing emerging market for wine, with 57% year-on-year growth, uh, import growth, and Angola is South Africa's fastest growing export uh, market for wine in Africa. It has achieved almost 6 million litres of import growth over the last year alone. Speaker, in the coming year, we will conduct dedicated marketing campaigns in both these markets to encourage the further uptake of our products. Another part of Project Police strategy is to double our share in the global halal market by 2025. We know that the current value of the global halal market is, market is worth 2.3 trillion US dollars, and that only 11% of that is being serviced with certified products. Now you will recall, when I, when I stood before you last year, I stressed that nas the national need to lobby for smarter agreements if we were to increase the number of global markets our produce can reach. To this end, Speaker, I was pleased by the announcement that South Africa was, uh, uh, was set to gain preferential trade access to a number of key markets through the tripartite free trade area agreement. This agreement, which seeks to address issues such as non-tariff trade barriers, will give us access to the majority of the world's Muslim population who are living in agriculturally marginalized areas. We are set to take advantage of this opportunity through our facilitation for yet another major infrastructure project. 
We are working with a range of stakeholders to guide the establishment of a sterilization and irradiation facility in the province. This project will enable us to comply with the regulations of importing countries and will alleviate the congestion at the Cape Town Harbour. Speaker, another element of market access is linked to the export of our animals. Ensuring our animal population is disease-free means that we are able to export to more markets. At this end, uh, at the end of uh, last year, sorry, Speaker, the largest consignment of horses was ever exported from the Western Cape to the United Emir Arab Emirates and Europe, with the assistance of this department's veterinary services program. This, in this financial year, veterinary services will survey 800,000 animals as part of its ongoing campaign uh, to ensure the health of our animal population, which numbers 2.3 million in livestock alone. In addition, we also note the implementation of the independent meat ins inspection, or IMI, at all abattoirs in South Africa, which is likely to result in an increased workload on the regulatory role of officials in the veterinary public health section. We will continue to monitor the situation. Speaker, to continue its efforts to manage animal disease, export control, and ensure the safety of meat production in the province, veterinary services receives 86 million rand in the next financial year. Speaker, while all of the above efforts are set to grow our agri-sectors, we know that we can only achieve real growth if we focus on building a resilient environment. To this end, we have allocated 97.7 million rand to our sustainable resource management program in this financial year. We're currently seeing firsthand the effects of extreme weather events. Climate change modeling shows that annual temperatures are rising and the number of colder days will decrease. Droughts, floods and heat waves will become more regular trends and uh, these trends highlight the need for a coordinated response from government and the private sector to mitigate the impact of climate change in our province. This is why the Western Cape government has partnered with the University of Cape Town's African Climate and Development Initiative to develop a climate change response plan, uh, Smart Agriculture for Resilience, uh, and we, we call it Smart Agriculture or Smart Agri. Smart Agri is a two-year project by the Western Cape Department of Agriculture and the Western Cape Department of Environmental Affairs and Development Planning. This initiative was launched in 2014, and we will have a complete plan in place by the end of this month. Smart Agri responds to the need for the practical and relevant climate change response plan, specifically for the agricultural sectors of the Western Cape. The University of Cape Town's African Climate and Development Initiative and a consortium uh, delivered a framework for implementation plan which uh, will guide the support and support the creation of greater resilience to climate change for farmers, agribusinesses and other stakeholders across the province. Residents living in rural areas for whom agriculture is a key employer will bear the brunt of the effects of climate change and that is why the plan will also include strategies to ensure that the workforce on farms is able to adapt to the changing environment. Speaker, this project is also a sterling example of Better Together, not only between the two departments, but also our stakeholders in the private sector. In addition, Speaker, a green agri-portal has been developed in collaboration with Green Cape, and the aim of the portal, which forms part of the department's climate change plan, is to increase access to relevant information to support our clients in their green initiatives. Uh, to focus, uh, or the focus, Speaker, on soil health will be intensified. Soil reform is critical in ensuring a sustainable agricultural sector. We know that we need soil to support crop production and subsequently animal production. We appeal to farmers to continue to partner with us in this drive. We have already had excellent achievements through the conservation agriculture approach. Uh, we are driving with the ARC, or Agricultural Research Council, these outcomes have been especially good in the small grain, potato and rooibos industries and we will continue to support this initiative with focused research and uh, technology transfers. And none was so evident as what we can see on the west coast at the moment 
and how this, uh, this initiative is helping agriculture in this time of drought. Speaker, through the above measures, we are putting practical and innovative plans in place to respond to climate change. By being responsive to our changing environment, we are making a significant contribution to creating a robust and competitive agricultural sector. The Western Cape is well positioned to lead the way. Speaker, we are also harnessing the power of innovation to come up with solutions to protect the future of our agricultural sector. To ensure that we make technology work for us, the Research and Technology Services Programme receives 109.6 million rand this financial year. It gives me great pleasure to announce that this kind of coming financial year, this program will launch 85 new research and technology uh, development projects to increase agricultural production, and we will share these updates as they happen. Speaker, as with uh, investing in innovation, one of the ways we can ensure our future is by investing in the youth. And for our student speaker, the uh, 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 Mokozeli family, or siblings, agriculture is a family business. For Tamsanka, Simtem Bile, Posi Sisa, and Tandiwe Mkosozeli were in the past year selected to be part of the 2015 AgriCita accredited learnership program at the Elsenberg Training uh, Institute. Tamsankwa Cynthia uh, Bile chose uh, to do the National Certificate, Animal Production, NQF Level 4 qualifications, and Fossi Zize op opted for the National Certificate, Plant Production, Vegetable Production, NQF 4 Level, and Tandiwe elected the National Certificate, Plant Production, Viticulture, NQF 4 Level. And speaker, the uh, Mokozeri uh, siblings are committed to their studies, and will use the skills they have learned to further grow the family's agribusiness, which is currently run by their father and mentor, Michael. It's young people like these siblings who will lead our sector in the future, Speaker. Yes, to expand opportunities for these young people in the agricultural sector, the Structured Agricultural Education and Training Program receives 58.7 million rand in the 2016-17 financial year. Speaker, in our plan to boost the number of graduates available to the agriculture sphere, we have set the target to ensure that 1,500 young people will benefit from our higher education and training program over the next three years. In addition to the training offered by the Agricultural Institute, the department delivers skills development through internship programs and bursaries. Our Young Professionals program, which supports black postgraduate students to develop their careers now includes a focus on agricultural leadership. This is how the Western Cape continues to invest in the future. It is going to take a momentous effort to put our vision into action, Speaker. It is going to take an innovative team who are committed to reaching these goals. And I'd like to thank the HOD, Joanne Isaacs, the Head of Department of Agriculture, for leading this very team, this right team that is going to make all the difference in this industry going forward. Their leadership and guidance is taking us closer to delivering the economy we want to build, the economy that every resident of the Western Cape deserves, and I really, really thank them for the hours and hours of dedication that they give to this sector. I also want to, in closing, Mr. Speaker, thank the Standing Committee for the role that they play in oversight, for the industry, as I said earlier, that are here today, for being here, for taking the time away from their businesses to be here for this speech, but also for the continued work that they do in this sector each and every day for those that couldn't be here. And then lastly, to uh, my team from the ministry I see up there, thank you very much for the support you give me in allowing me to do my job. And then perhaps last of all, to my family who can't be here today, but also for what they do to allow me to do this job. I thank you. Before I see the next speaker, can I just remind the 
visitors that you're most welcome in the galleries, but you are observers there, and please do not take part in the proceedings by either cheering or clapping or commenting on anything. I see the Honourable uh, Schaefer. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I stand here today in a critical year for all of our farms. Despite the recent rains over the past few days and, and even in, in the last night, every workers and farmers face one of the worst droughts we can ever remember. This year is certainly not a year for business as usual, and I send my deepest thoughts to, a daily, to those that, with a daily struggle that so many in the agricultural sector are now facing. Agriculture is the backbone of the rural economy and employment in this province. While the Western Cape exports 55% of national agricultural exports, it becomes tightly linked to our food system and food security for this country. Criticism is often directed onto farmers being accused of not planning properly for drought-related disasters. However, it's been reported by AgriSA that the current drought is one of such a great intensity that it is beyond the ability of any farmer to plan despite his or her resource base. Furthermore, it is estimated that it could take at least three years for farmers to recover from this devastating drought. But, Speaker, while the drought can result in farms going bankrupt, for the consumer it is estimated that this drought will result in 11% food price inflation by the end of 2016. Just yesterday, it was reported in the media that already food prices have increased by 8% just three months into this calendar year and in particular, an increase in bread and maize, which we know will hit the poorest people in our country first. The drought has certainly highlighted the importance of the DA-led Western Cape in promoting sustainable agricultural practices. With the scarcity of water in the country, farmers can no longer ignore sound conservation farming practices, and I welcome the Minister's drive to push conservation farming in the Western Cape. We also acknowledge the province's wheat farmers who have already adopted this practice and are seeing a greater increase in production while at the same time reducing soil erosion and improving water quality and soil health. It is certainly a travesty though when the ANC government erroneously and stubbornly refuses to declare the drought a national disaster, even though almost 34 million South Africans are affected by moderate to extreme drought. And this was reported in a present and presented in a joint portfolio committee meeting at the national parliament by the department of water and sanitation last week so minister we really welcome the extra 23 million you have found to support farmers affected by the drought and the da-led western cape is waiting patiently for the national department of agriculture to officially declare the west coast and central karoo municipal disaster areas the longer we wait, Minister, the higher the amount increases. So our committee urges you to place the necessary pressure on your national counterparts to release the much-needed much funding necessary to alleviate some of the impact. We welcome the fact that the Department has allocated some funds to emerging grain farmers for a period of time and supporting emerging animal farmers in the West Coast and Central Karoo Municipal Districts with a commitment of 11 million rand. Without the additional assistance from national government, we cannot help the larger farms, which are so crucial for jobs, our food security, and food prices for the poor. However, the last crisis took two years before national government provided emergency assistance, and if they drag their feet much longer, this time we will face a fully blown disaster. Interestingly, Speaker, at a global level, I've been told that the price index of food is currently lower than that of the 1960s in terms of real food prices. In South Africa, however, we do not experience these benefits due to the weakening exchange rate. Again, it is the poor which suffers most as they spend the biggest part of their income or grant funding on food. Although the department implemented 103 community food security projects, including 18 school gardens, and 1,492 household gardens across the province to enhance food security. We call on the minister to really assist in doubling those numbers. While schools have challenges around water and school holidays where gardens are left unattended, I do believe that gardens at schools could easily be assisted by the community. Here is the space in which I believe that the department and our municipalities can do a whole lot more, creating accessibility to food. We are also worried about how national government's red tape worsens the impact of drought. 
a report backlog of more than the 1,500 water license applications submitted to the National Department has yet to be finalized by the end of 2015. These applications come at a great cost to farmers who are already struggling under financial strain. We now see a record number of farms for sale in water-stressed provinces, with 3,485 farms for sale in the Western Cape alone. Speaker, we have to do our utmost to ease the situation. National government should be helping farmers instead of making their lives more difficult. However, Mr. Rashid Khan, Chief Director of the Department of Water Affairs in the Western Cape region, in a Premier's coordinating forum on the 1st of March, has blatantly stated that the Western Cape doesn't have a water problem. Yet full a full flay dam is currently sitting at 20.5% full, brun flay at 34%, bacrophyr at 26.9%, while flodus cloud is at only 10%. We don't need any more proof to state that the Western Cape is facing a dire water crisis. Speaker, a report commissioned by the International Labour Organization in a briefing to the National Parliament's Portfolio <coughs> Committee on Rural Development and Land Reform on the outcomes of a study into the living conditions of farm workers stated that the Western Cape farmers pay their workers 24% better than the second best provinces and 51% more than Limpopo. The DA-led Western Cape has participated actively at transforming this sector and continues to do so at every level. Raising awareness on labour registration through the distribution of the Agri-Worker Labour Rights Booklet, Working Together, a quick guide for farm workers, is published in all three languages. I'm going to make sure that my committee gets some of these. And it's the right type of intervention that this department makes to support a healthier rural employment environment in the Western Cape. Through the provincial-wide farm worker household census findings, the first census of its kind, stakeholders will also be empowered with information to address the actual needs of farm employees. Speaker, a new initiative by the national government is the Compulsory Community Services Program, which requires qualified vets to perform community service for 12 months to assist with much-needed animal welfare and export opportunities. We welcome the 19 CCS vets allocated to the Western Cape to assist the alleviating the burden placed on vets here in this province. We hope the scheme will continue each year, as a lack of sufficient number of vets has been raised as a concern by our standing committee. A veterinary export certification office in Milnerton, as a dedicated office focusing on export certification matters, is also welcomed and addresses specifically Project Colisa's needs. The implementation of independent meat inspection at all abattoirs in South Africa, which includes the promulgation of proposed game regulations, is also a positive move as more and more game farms are emerging in the Western Cape. However, we know that we are still at least in need of 10 employed vets in order to address the three schemes and legislative issues promulgated by National and the 800,000 animals needing to be surveyed. So, Minister Wendy, while we welcome your monitoring of the situation, we ask how are you going to address this important and growing need in the province? The Alternative Crops Fund back in 2014, Speaker, for research needs of the smaller industries, which are a niche mark with niche market potential, such as your honeybush tea, your figs, and your olives. These are uh, labor-intensive and create jobs. And these industries will open up a new agri-processing and value-adding opportunities to agri-entrepreneurs, and we welcome this. And, Speaker, what I must commend the Department for is its cost-saving changes to investigating and, obviously, if feasible, implementing energy-saving devices and other processes to make the entire head office and its college area less grid-dependable and, if possible, completely off the grid. The Department has reported a repetitive saving in excess of $15 million per year, which increases annually way beyond inflation and this to be made available to pursue the department's commitment to the game changes within Project Colisa. This is really great news. Sustainable resource management speaker sees an 18% increase and almost 15 million extra in its budget. The program focuses to support land reform and increase climate smart agricultural product production. The committee has 
the committee has been briefed on the Smart Agri, which is a 2.8 million project, which responds to the need for a practical and relevant climate change response plan, specifically for the agricultural sector of the Western Cape province. And we look forward to its completion in the next few weeks, in which a climate change response implementation plan will accompany this framework. This will provide a roadmap for actionable and prior to prioritized initiatives, which will take the agricultural sector towards greater resilience in the face of climate change. This is about looking ahead and planning. It's about the sustainability of future generations, and we commend the work being done here. Speaker, Stats SA has shown that the period from 2009 to 2014, the agricultural sector has grown by 24% to 18.5 billion. It follows that the department is well on its way to achieving the department's commitment to supporting the sector and maintain its export position, growing its value add from 16 billion in 2013. I would also like, Speaker, to gratulate, congratulate the Western Cape Department of Agriculture for receiving a green card for employment equity compliance from the Commission for Gender Equality. Some of the achievements made by the department were the following, taking strides in addressing all the recommendations made by the, com the Commission for Gender Equality, including an employment in equity plan, significant increase of African females moving into higher salary levels, sponsoring of tertiary studies for 24 youth and bursaries for 47 female staff, and a female recipient of a master's scholarship is now heading the Agricultural Economic Division. It is encouraging to see that with a capable government, we can create an inclusive environment and promote transformation. This goes further to prove how the DA governs in practice and creating freedom, fairness, and opportunities for all. And Speaker, I must also commend this department under the leadership of Minister Wendy, not only for their delivery, but for their commitment and loyalty. At the interrogation of the department's budget, I asked the entire department to share with us how long they'd been in employment. And we were astounded that many of the, of, uh, the officials had service records of more than 15 years. This is to be noted and commended. Thank you, Minister Wendy and Joanne Isaacs and all the department for the work you do to change the lives of the people in the Western Cape. And thank you to my committee for the support and the oversight they provide. So speaking in conclusion, the DA supports vote 11, the Western Cape Appropriation Bill for the Department of Agriculture. I thank you. The Akbar Led Davids. Uh, no, don't tell me how to talk. You play politics, I will play politics too. Uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Deputy Secretary. Um, uh, Deputy. Oh, oh thank the... you, Honourable Deputy uh, Speaker, for the opportunity to speak on the vote 11. I want to start this debate with a quote from the very important living and guiding document, and was declared by that was declared by the representatives of the people at the People's Assembly in Club Town in 1955. The Freedom Charter, amongst others said that the land shall be set amongst those who work in it. It further explains that the land ownership restriction shall be abolished and guarantee, guaranteed freedom of movement of those who work on the land. These extracts are still very relevant and instructive to the government of today. And Speaker, Deputy Speaker, yesterday it was a long debate when uh, member Carol Beerwinkel was speaking on st uh, stick to the vote, stick to the vote. But today I see the MEC Windy and the chairperson of the standing committee didn't stick to the vote, they played politics, so let us go there. Thank you. I want to start off with this book Honourable that was- Honorable Davids, let me put you at ease. Uh, both of them spoke to the vote. Agriculture is the topic for the day, and yeah, you may speak they on agriculture. Yeah, but it's fine, spe Deputy Speaker, because you are dear, you must say they spoke to the vote. I, can't, I couldn't hear that. Say again. Uh, it's fine, Deputy Honorable Speaker. Honorable David, just repeat that. <laughs> it's fine, Deputy Speaker. You are the Deputy Speaker. You can decide what they spoke about, but what I heard is politics. I didn't hear the vote. Uh, yes, you yeah. may speak politics as long as you speak okay, politics. Okay, I want to start Honorable with this Davids, book. You may speak politics as long as it relates to the topic, the, the which vote, is agriculture. Yes. I want to start off with this book. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I've just received the book, and as I'm scrolling to it, I don't see uh, here and there I see assistance to the farmers here, the women farmers here, but I don't see assistance from the Department of Agriculture to this woman. I want to start off with the Meijer Geersie van Defender in Drakenstein. 
There's no assistance, yes, he's a commercial farmer. She took money from the Drakenstein municipality to put security uh, 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 um, cameras at the farm because uh, apparently it was said that some of the things on the farm were stolen. So now today again, I'm, I'm shocked to see that she's in this book again. Why? To market herself because this is marketing happening here. This is clear marketing for all these farmers here. And then I want to speak on page 19 on the farmer. Um, now my speech is there. I want to first tackle you with this book. Don't worry, just listen. It's good to listen. On page 19 on the Apollon farming, I want to know from the department how many black farmers is there in this province that is doing Apollon farming and they are assisted by this uh, uh, committee, by this department. And then I want to welcome the, farm, the farmer of the gardening, Ms. Notumbu. No, no, no. I want to welcome her because I see now for the first time, because when these, uh, when the leadership on that side, the honorable members on that side, open their mouths, they always say in another province there's nothing good coming from there. But I see here, she was drawn to agriculture because of her grandmother that did cattle farming in the Eastern Cape. That's why she's doing farming. So there is good coming from other provinces into the Western Cape. Thank you. However, we do not see a political will on the part of the Western Cape government to achieve these noble objectives of the Freedom Charter. Nowhere does this budget talk about qualitative development of farm workers when, and families. When the Honorable MEC opened his mouth, he only thanked the farmers and he thanked the, the private sector. He didn't thank the farm workers who's actually doing the work, whose sweat is actually falling in the ground on the farms. But that is your mindset, MEC, and we know it by now. Your mindset is making money and not contributing to human resource of the livelihood of the farm workers. The farm workers are standing up at 4 o'clock in the morning, sometimes 3 o'clock in the morning, to go and work on somebody's farm where they're not even getting clean water, where they don't have sanitation. Then that farmer tell them, go to Zuma for a toilet, go to Zuma for clean water, forgetting that that is the same farm worker that is bringing money into his pocket, not their pocket because even with the salary scale that there is today, there's not one farmer that they can say that they're not deducting more money from the farm worker. They are deducting now money to drive the kids to school. They are deducting money to take the person to a doctor. They are deducting money if they take them on Friday or Saturdays to town, whereas before 1989, they didn't do that. They were freely giving transport to the people to take them to the kids to school. They were freely giving transport to take them to doctor and everything. Just one second. Order. No, Order. I, I'm saying Order. don't come here and only say Order. thank you to the farmers. Remember, just one second. Honourable Casilla, is that a question or a, do you want to ask a question? Yes, yes Deputy Speaker. Let me just one. inquire. Honourable Davis, are you prepared to take a question? She's, she's not prepared to take a question. Order, please, please continue. I'm not scared. I'm only scared of God, not of human beings. Sorry. Order. The rural did down around Yellen, Yellen, please, Order. Yellen, Order. come back. Order, come, calm down, please, ask. Order. Order. Honorable Chief Whip. Uh, thanks, Deputy Speaker. The members in this house are honorable, uh, even the Speaker. I did not hear that, but I concur. All members are uh, honourable. Please continue. Thank you. Sorry, Chief Whip. Honourable Member, Premier Yellen Zellen, please come back because you are the number one of this province. Come back. Is the farm workers now? The Rural Development Model, which was adopted in 2009 and reviewed in 2015, has not been implemented. There's no account on how many jobs, although the MEC today said there's 2,000 and how. What's the amount? Let me see. 30 jobs created in the Western Cape. I want to say it here on record. That is not permanent jobs. 
That is seasonal jobs. The percentage of permanent jobs in this province is 7% MEC. Permanent jobs in this province is 7%. Go to your, f I want you to MEC. You know, sometimes you must not rely on, on all the information you will see, receive. Go to the farms and check. The percentage now have gone down of permanent workers in this province. We are working with seasonal workers. C come to the farm. Come to with the farms with me, Honorable Wiley. Please do your bit and come to the farms with me. Then you will get your information there. Not here, there. Dead? No, not Kosatu. Please, the farm workers. Not Kusatu. Come with me. I will invite you. I will even drive you to come with me and show you. There's no more that big amount of permanent farm workers in this province. We are talking about Honorable Wiley. Let me explain to you. You know, order, we are talking order, about farm workers order, that only work. Order. Just one second. Honorable Minister. Can my honorable colleague address the deputy speaker? Yes, I was going to raise the same point. <laughs> honorable Davids. You've heard what the minister okay. said. Okay, there's no longer a, a relevance to the NDP number seven and PSG number one and four. Instead, the focus has shifted towards elsewhere. The booklet work, the booklet work working together, like the MEC said, does not create jobs, nor does it empower farm workers to own the land they are working. We are saying, uh, Deputy Speaker. It's by far now time that if I'm a farm worker and my mother was a farm worker and my grandma was a farm worker and my great grandmother was a farm worker, that my kid must become a farm owner. My kid must become a farm owner. They cannot be a farm worker forever. And you know, Deputy Speaker, what is happening out there? When we are old, they just take you. You are dry lemon now. There's no juice coming out of you anymore. And they throw you in an informal settlement. Yeah. Then the MEC of Human Settlement must struggle to put a dorky there, a sungoki, for you to get in as a farm worker because you were evicted, because you're not productive anymore on the farm. Nowhere in this budget is there a mention of promoting black industrialists with the agricultural sector. This is a very important intervention that the provincial department through this department ought to do in order to improve the lives of the rural communities of the Western Cape, especially young graduates. And I'm glad to see that is the students from the agriculture here today of Elsenberg. It's very good. Most of whom are coming from historical disadvantaged communities. What is also happening, uh, uh, Deputy Speaker, is that I graduate, studied agriculture, but I don't, I don't own a farm. My family don't own a farm. So then I must go and work on a farm. I start off as a farm worker. They don't take into recognition my studies. Yes. I'm a graduate or I'm this. I start off as a farm worker earning the same amount of a person next to me that didn't study what I studied. So we, we need to look into that. I was saying we're just going to pump, pump, pump the industry with graduates, but there's no way that we can assist them to become farmers on their own. By this, by these words, Honorable MEC Alan, Alan Winde acknowledged that only 1% of black families own farms, yet there is no mention on how black families will be assisted except to invite uh, partners to come together in order to escalate the number of successful land reform projects. This, how part is absent in this commitment. African Farm Workers Association of South Africa Afasa, Secretary General outlined how a five-year strategy to drive commercial farming could be transformed in this province. Are his suggestions and advice both in the provincial strategic plans? I wonder, it's a question. He observed that there is no commercial black farmers in this province. Instead, the provincial government prefers to use farm share equity schemes where white commercial farmers to keep, continue to keep the land ownership and only allocate shares of their business to farm workers. And I want to make an example, especially in Drakenstein, where we went to Stellenbosch to the legal department to lay charges of specific farms, but I'm only going to mention one farm here, is the 
Pearl Rouse Farm in Drakenstein in the main road, where farm workers were given shares in 1999 to become farm owners, shareholders of that farm. Deputy Speaker, you can go today. There's a development on that land. Up till now, those farm workers didn't get one single cent. What happened of that money? Are the Department of Rural Development looking into cases like that within this province? Because then they will come to plus minus 300 farmers where farm workers' IDs were taken without them knowing that they are now shareholders and then on the end of the day being evicted from that farm, farm and then that agricultural land become a, develop, a development where houses for people with money are built. Are worse off than they were when the schemes were started. More work is needed to be done in this regard. In the Western Cape, the price of uh, agricultural land, especially in the West Coast, is very expensive for acre. I think it's plus minus 200,000 rand an acre in the West Coast. And we want to know why is it so expensive? Because then it means that black people, black people that wants to farm that wants to buy their own agricultural land, they can't because it's too expensive for them to buy land in the West Coast. So we want the, uh, the uh, department to look into that. Why is agricultural land so expensive, especially in the West Coast? If we are serious about food security, food security and there is people that wants to farm, why is it so so difficult for black farmers to get land. It's not surprising that the allocation of the budget per program is not favoring the farmer support and development sub program because there is no political will to do so. A mere 1.14 percent increment revised estimate is an insult to the poor and rural communities in the Western Cape. What concerns me most is the summary of payments and estimates where the use of consultants and professional services on infrastructure and planning is going up from 1.1 million to 3.9 million, totaling 246% increase revised estimate. In pro program two, sub Sustainable resource management, which provides agricultural support to existing and commercial farmers who are by and large white males. And we are getting, the department gets a grant from national to support, the priority of national is to support small scale farmers. But nowhere we are seeing the strategic goals are silent on the need to change types of ownership and attract the historical disadvantage into the mainstream agricultural activities and land ownership so that the landscape can be transformed. The farmer support and development program in the annual performance plan falls short of showing how the transformation of 20% of agricultural land in East District will be achieved and how agricultural land reform projects would achieve total transformation in the sector. And what is the time frames? Is it five years or 10 years? For, furthermore, the conditional grant of, on EPWP, which is I think it's 2 point some million rand, must be increased in order to have more people working to remove the alien vegetation that wildfires and thereby cause more disasters in the province. That we can, because there's a lot of fires that is happening because of the alien plants. So we are saying increase the EPWP amount so that there can be more workers go out and destroy these plants. Then I want to go, Deputy Speaker, to Philippi. We are saying, as yes, this province, we are supporting the small-scale farmers, and we are serious about job creation, we are serious about food security. We have a situation, Deputy Speaker, in Philippi, just around the corner here as we go out here. Small-scale farmers, Deb, uh, Deputy Speaker, are threatened with eviction from the city council, and that is agricultural land. They want to build houses there now, Deputy Speaker. If we are saying we have a shortage of uh, chairperson of the committee in food security in our country, in food security in the Western Cape, why are we threatening people that are doing food security for years 
in the Philippi area and that have a market and that is close to the market where they are selling their stuff. Why are we trying to evict them as the DA government in the city of Cape Town? The DA good government in the city of Cape Town? Trying to evict people in Philippi where there's agricultural land and to make it a housing project. Agricultural farming land in favor of building so-called lands down corridor with its combination housing and a business park. So it's a business park and it's housing combined. We are saying we are serious about food security. The current occupants in that land are small scale farmers who have been trading there for many years. They've been trading there for many years. So please, honor, that's why I wanted the Honorable Premier to be here, so that she can speak to a leader, uh, the uh, mayor of Cape Town, not to evict those people. And we want the MEC of local government to go and check and do environmental tests there. Because you need to do environmental tests, you need to rezone the area before you can do what they want to do to evict people. The establishment of a law park, of the law park, although it looks, it's, it looks very interesting when the department also presented to us, it's a good thing. But we are just saying that more questions must, uh, we must ask more questions in terms of who is the mutual beneficiaries of the park, what is the business model, and where does the life, um, where does the livestock will come from because it's a law park. And we just want to know also, is it going to be open for everyone in the Western Cape or only for the Muslim community? There's just questions. And then we also want to know, uh, um, is the city involved? The, because the, if they want to evict for Lapi, how are they going to allow a uh, uh, law park? Is the municipality of the city of Cape Town involved? And also, do, do you have a, a letter of approval from the Department of Rural Development nationally? Are they also on board with this business park, the Alau Park? And then the APP does not stipulate how the department will contribute towards creation, creating one million agricultural jobs as contained in the National Development Plan. And here, Deputy Speaker, we're not speaking about jobs for the sake of jobs. We are speaking about security. We are speaking about a job, a permanent job, a job that will sustain me so that I can say to my kid, no, you can't go to that school because mommy can pay. I can say to my mother, no, you can't go to the doctor because I have money to pay for the doctor. I'm not talking about a job for three months and a job for two months, like what happened in the wine industry now, just now, with, the, with they claiming to have this big drought. People were just working for, no, 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 we will talk about that because it's only happened in West Coast. We will come there, don't worry, I'm going to speak that. But uh, uh, people just work for a certain period of time. They didn't work the whole season. Whilst now what they're doing, Deputy Speaker, they finish the people off at the end of February, but they are calling in, in, them in like, come today, stay tomorrow, come next day, stay that day. So they are still using workers, although they said the season ends on the end of February. A research commissioned by the International Labour Organization in 2015 on the farm workers and living conditions in South Africa found that most farm workers between 2000, farmers between 2004 and 2014 had reduced permanent employment ranking from 7% to 3.3%. Many farms are said to be increasingly using labor brokers which have their own challenges such as threatening employment security, poor working conditions and instability in the sector. This is a concerning de development needs and it needs attention from this legislature. Perhaps the standing committee should undertake site visits to some of these farms and have first-hand information and find ways to med medicate the negative effects because it happened is a reality and we need to go there and see for ourselves. 
At the beginning of the year, and with the drought affecting some parts of the province, Mr. Nosey Peterson, the chief negotiator. Order. Uh, Remember, just finish off your time has expired, but finish off your last okay, sentence. Please. Okay, thank you, thank you, Deputy Speaker. It's fine. Let me go to the last. Let me your last sentence, the last sentence, not the last paragraph. I'm not going to use that. We are told that the national hey. government is not willing to assist the provincial farmers to declare Western Cape drought, a drought disaster. What we are not told is that the province only applied for the West Thank Coast you, as part Thank of the Central Kaduda District, not there, the entire province. Thank you. Your time has now really expired. Um, <laughs> the Honourable Minister Windy to respond to the debate. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, thank you to the participants in this debate. Uh, first of all, to the chairperson of the committee, uh, Beverly Schaefer, thank you very much for the role that you play, for the oversight role. Uh, if I'll try and deal with a couple of the points you raised, but you started off talking about the drought. Um, and, you know, obviously, uh, as I mentioned in the speech, it's not only about a drought in our province or our country, it's in Southern Africa. It is a major issue, and it's going to be with us for a few years. Uh, even if we have really, really good rains, the risk, and you've heard from uh, uh, the Minister of Local Government, uh, although we're in an agricultural debate at the moment, but the risk is also about the rural economy and those towns and our capacity to hold water uh, or to store water um, so that we have uh, uh, just drinking water available in our towns. And uh, at the moment, uh, all of our dams are under severe threat. Um, and uh, so we need to have sustained rain. And of course, rain doesn't just fix the drought because uh, the implications of drought, and specifically those farmers that are here today that are involved with, uh, with livestock farming, um, you know, it, it rains today, the food that those animals need to eat doesn't appear tomorrow. Um, that, so, so fodder takes a while to, to grow. And so we are going to have this, this uh, drought issue with us for a while and really hope that we do have rains um, sufficient rains that actually alleviate this problem. But water itself is a big issue and it's going to be a big issue going forward. It is something that uh, we as a government are taking very, very seriously. You would have seen all the work that we've done already. This department, the Department of Environmental Affairs and the private sector and local government in, uh, in uh, on the Berg River project. Uh, I spoke about, about dams and we, we've got two dams, uh, the Clan William Dam and, and, and the work that we're doing as well. Um, if, you, if you look at that storage capacity, that's just scratching the surface. I think we are going to have to look at spending money on research, on technology and on innovation around water, water, water usage and what water means for our total economy in the region over the next 50 years. It is probably the uh, most inhibiting factor to the economy at the moment. And I think we as a government are going to have to put it into... Uh, game changer uh, or that kind of project status where we really start to elevate and, and, and take it to front and center. You spoke about food gardens, the youth learning, um, and of course I think food gardens, uh, while, while uh, dealing with food security issues, is also the perfect place for people to understand the meaning of growing your own food, uh, the nutritional value of that food, um, how it uh, can change your life, and specifically young people. And uh, whether you spoke about youth as the chair, or, or Honorable David spoke also about young people coming in and the youth, um, and, and I mentioned in my speech, uh, especially Andres van der Poel, when I visited him and he spoke about and I said about his son, but in actual fact, uh, he was actually talking about his three children, and he said his son saying he wants to farm, but in actual fact, all three of his kids want to want to farm, and he's got to make sure that he uh, can acquire that land so that they can, they can also live out this dream. And that's really exciting for me, because um, sometimes I think that uh, young people specifically do not want to go into agriculture. Um, the HOD and the department run a program where young people are brought into Elsenburg, and uh, I remember the last time when I was there, uh, not, we, we had it at uh, Boschendal, and I asked the I asked I can't remember, a couple of hundred young people uh, there, and I said, who of you are going to go into agriculture? And only a very few hands went up. And that's why that project is being run, to show 
um, the exciting part of the science called agriculture. It is a science. It is, it is something that, uh, you know, gone are the days that, uh, you know, you're just going to go and farm. You, you need to have maths and science. You need to be able to go and study. You need to be able to go and be competitive in this space uh, because it is a science and it is very competitive globally, but it is also very, very essential. So food gardens are also that, that space that incubates and, and brings people into, into agriculture. Uh, I spoke about water, the water problems. You mentioned uh, some of these issues. Um, and I know that the Standing Committee has asked for, the, for Water Affairs to come and talk to them. And maybe you should keep that going as a, as a regular oversight space because, because water is such a critical issue, and specifically water licenses. Um, I'll get to the Honourable David just now, but she did speak about value of land. And uh, value of land is nothing without water. Uh, if you add water it, to it in an agricultural sense, it changes the value of that land. And water licensing um, is a critical part on that value, but also a critical part on allowing us to grow and achieve the 10% uh, uh, target that we've set ourselves in the department, or getting land reform to work. Getting land reform to work, we need to have a growing economy. We need to have a growing uh, market. Um, and of course, agriculture in that space, specific in food security, it's generally a given as long as the rest of the recipe is in place. Uh, you mentioned the booklet, and uh, that booklet that you mentioned, uh, I'll get to the actual, to this Abundant Harvest book just now when I get to the Honorable Davids, but uh, the booklet that you spoke about actually came about post a visit that I and the department did, and uh, walking from farm to farm, walking and engaging with farm workers, in actual fact, we gave explicit instructions on that visit that we didn't want to speak to any management. We only wanted to speak to farm workers. And in that process, I can't remember, 82 farms or something um, that we visited, the farm workers of 82 farms, um, it was evident to me that we needed tools and mechanisms to help farm workers understand their rights, to, un to, to understand um, you know, what, 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 was, what their rights were, where they stood, and that book that is specifically for that. And it definitely is there to make a difference uh, for farm workers. And I think, again, maybe on that point, and, uh, well, I'll ex actually, I'll wait, till, I'll wait till I get to the Honourable Davids, because uh, she's given me quite a lot to talk about. Um, green energy, um, uh, you spoke about uh, innovation and a green energy project. That's one thing about this department. This department is open to innovation. This department is open to new ideas. This department listens to what's happening and then takes on board, and, and that's why you see, we talk about green energy and I mean, they're a leading department on, on doing it internally, on showing, uh, uh, you know, how to do these things themselves so that they can influence what happens outside there in the rest of the province. And whether it's in green, green tech and green energy or whether it's conservation agriculture or whether it's uh, uh, research looking at alternative crops, it's about looking at new things and innovative things to, to remain competitive and to support this, this great industry uh, in our province. Um, then you also spoke about the, it was actually interesting in, during, that, uh, during that session with the Standing Committee, the average of 15 years about. It says a lot to, uh, about the department when you see that people in this department actually stay there. They, they give long-term service to this industry, and I uh, also would like to recognize that. But it also says a lot to the leadership and to, to, to the team um, that people are comfortable in that space and, and that they're making a difference and they feel their worth. So uh, I, I, it was good that you recognized that. Then to get to the Honorable Davids. Um, I wrote on the top here, you need to get into the real world. Now, um, because it was actually quite interesting in how you were talking and you were contradicting yourself as you go through. And I'll start off by talking about policy. Because you mentioned about the percentage of workers dropping. Well, the numbers in Stats SA are not saying that. But of course, your point is correct that in agriculture, how we are seeing more and more uh, uh, seasonal workers brought in. But why? Do you ever ask yourself the question, why is that happening in agriculture? Why do we have more and more seasonal workers coming into the system? What is the reason? You see, you see, the real reason that we have this is because of restrictive labor legislation. Because of restrictive labor legislation. 
ask yourself why we have, uh, and she mentions it as well, why do we have within our agricultural system labor brokers? Why do we have labor brokers in South Africa at all? Why do we need to have labor brokers? Ask yourself that question. What is the reason that this happens? And you see... Order, order. Maybe you may continue. I'm just addressing the Honorable Davids, actually. Thank you. I thought she'd had her turn, and now she doesn't. I listened to her when she spoke, um, but she doesn't want to listen to me when it's my turn to speak. Uh, Member Davids, do you want to ask the minister a question? No. Oh. Member Wendy, minister, minister, you may continue. So, Deputy Speaker, I will apologize for asking the direct question. I'm going to ask the question via you so that when she goes home tonight, she will think about what I've said so that she can do a little bit of homework. Order. Honorable Davids, please allow the member now to continue. So it is about policy and policy uncertainty. And in actual fact, in the agricultural sector, that is probably one of the biggest problems is, is policy uncertainty. When we have different policies put on the table every single day in a space that takes serious commitment and investment and long-term investment. You know, when I came to agriculture, um, I, in, my, in my private life, my life before politics, I was actually an entrepreneur. I had many businesses, but I was never, I was oh, never no. had a business in the agricultural sector. Although I grew up on a, on a farm, I never, I never personally was involved in an agribusiness other than perhaps when I was a youngster with a, my own vegetable garden selling vegetables. But, but the one thing that really hit me was that in agriculture, it, an entrepreneur in agriculture, and a farmer is an entrepreneur, they need to be an entrepreneur. They need to be entrepreneurial. You will not survive in agriculture if you're not an entrepreneur, if you can't think that way. And the one thing about agriculture is that you take the risks that would happen ordinarily in the economy, and you just add a whole lot more risks to it when you get into agriculture, a whole lot more risks than the average entrepreneur has to deal with. And it is really tough. It's a tough place to operate in. And when you have uncertainty in the policy environment, it makes it tougher. It really, really does. And I take my hat off to everyone involved in agriculture for investing and doing what they do during this time of policy uncertainty. But uh, we need to always ask ourselves these questions. Well, the, the, the Honorable Minister did ask me a question. She says, she says, to, she says to me, she says to me, the Honorable Member says to me, how many emerging farmers? Now, Again, uh, not only welcome to the real world or try and become part of the real world, listen, listen to the speech. You, you react to the speech. This is called the debate. You're supposed to listen to the debate and then react to it. I mentioned the number, 1,572. 1,572. That's how many emerging farmers were assisted in this last year. And if you go and read the speech, you will see there's more than 4,500 that are going to be assisted in the next three years. So you see, and it's also in this space. She mentioned about how a kid can become a farm owner. And that's exactly what I spoke about in the speech. That's exactly what happens in Elsenburg of how we are preparing young people who would like to get into this industry, how people who would like to become farmers are able to become a farmer in the system. But here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have probably the biggest policy clash in this space. The Honourable Member started off by, by reading from the Freedom Charter and talking about the Freedom Charter. She then speaks about how we want kids to be able to own land and farm. Her own political party's policy, her own policy is not to allow land ownership. Go and have a look at the Department of Land Reform where they believe in farm by committee. Get 100 people onto a farm and expect them to farm without the rail tools. I spoke about not giving the lease. Order, order. Order. Minister Wendy, you may continue, but please calm down. Please give the minister time. So order, it's their own order, policy. Order, Honourable Davids. 
Misleading the House is not a point, not a point of order, but uh, I can't comment whether he's doing it. Minister and I would like to, in a whole lot of questions that were asked by the Honourable Member around leased land and leases, about ownership, about the poll issue, and about the price of land, I would like this committee to put it on the agenda to ask the Minister of Land Reform, Rural Development, and his department to come here, just like they did with the Water Affairs Department, and ask them exactly those programs. We will give them all of those properties of where farmers are waiting for leases from the department. We'll give them every single one order, of those, and they order, can Minister, ask directly Minister, that question. Just, it just, would just one help second. Us. Honourable Davids, um, I've given you far too much liberty now to speak all the time. You've given your speech, now it's time to listen to the reply. Minister Wendy, you may continue. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, she spoke about aquaculture projects. There are three aquaculture projects that the department is supporting at the moment. She spoke about halal. Uh, the halal process is going into, we're going into that process at the moment. In the next debate, uh, she can talk about that as well because the Department of Economic Development is busy with the, uh, going through that process now. It's not only in the city of Cape Town. There's opportunities in every single municipality in this province. And of course, the study is looking at three sites, which includes municipalities in the Winelands. Um, the, the Honourable Member also spoke about the drought and that it's the, the supposed drought that the wine industry is talking about, I think were her words. Um, and she said it's only on the west coast. I would like her to go to visit some of the parts of the winelands. Go to Tolbach and go and actually have a look at these little withered raisins hanging on the vine. Go and have a look there herself. If she's, the, if she's in agriculture, she must actually go and have a look, please, because she will see it's not only on the west coast that this uh, devastation of drought has hit this, this industry. Um, I think uh, I'll leave that. I've got a, I was going to say a whole lot on, on, uh, on the... Um, on the labor broking, but I'll leave that. I'll come lastly to this point of this book, which is what she started her discussion with. And basically went on the attack. Now, I will ask her again, just as she should go home and do her homework, read my speech, because it will have answered a lot of those things she was raising. Will she please go and read this book? And she will see that every single one of these people in this book were part of a program. And you'll see, actually see if you look at the photographs. She doesn't have to read it. You can just look at the photographs and see that it goes back past, past a couple of ministers, even prior to my political party coming into power in this. Because this is a part of the, the, the National Department's Entrepreneurial Program. The National Department's Entrepreneurial Program Order. for women. And this honors these women. This honors these women in agriculture. And I really am saddened that, that she had to, to, to negatively say, she, had to ne she was also a winner of this thing at a national level, she, that she negatively had to take on this book because this book is, this book. Order. Order, please come to order the side. Please can manage Because continue? Mr. Deputy Speaker, this book talks about courage. This book talks about the real agricultural entrepreneurial change that we want to see in our region. And that's why this book and these people who are put in this book, who are those leaders in our region, need to be honored, respected, and celebrated. And that's what this book is about. And I'm really sorry that the Honorable uh, Member David had to pull it down. But I promise you, we honor, respect, these ladies, because they are making a massive difference in our province. And with that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> that concludes the debate on this vote.